Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to today's uh, online event. I'm Andy Haldane. I'm the RSA's Chief Executive. I'm delighted to have the chance to talk today to Jason Cowley about his brilliant new book, uh, Who Are We Now? Stories of uh, Modern England. Here it is on my desk right in front of us. Jason, as you all know, uh, is an award-winning uh, journalist and writer, widely regarded as having transformed the fortunes of the New Statesman magazine, where he's editor-in-chief. He hasn't yet done that uh, to his football team, Arsenal, uh, but I know that Hope Springs Eternal, uh, Jason, on that front for the season ahead. Uh, for those of you that you've uh, read Who Are We Now? Um, I'm sure you'll agree with me. It's a really absorbing and beautifully written account of the key events really of the past 25 years or so in English national life, from Blair to Brexit uh, to COVID. It's also, though, I think a profound and moving reflection on Englishness uh, and the shared experiences and values that unite, but also sometimes divide uh, people uh, in the UK. So huge amounts uh, to delve into with Jason uh, today. For those of you watching along who'd like to join the conversation, you're more than welcome to do so uh, on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, hashtag RSA stories, or you can add your comments uh, in our own YouTube uh, chat. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to be with you, Andy. Thank you very much. Uh, full disclosure before we start, Jason did actually interview me for this book, so I can't claim any objectivity uh, at all, but it was nonetheless fascinating, Jason, to, to read the final version, and I really look forward to us chatting some more about it. Just to kick us off, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, so when I left the bank, I did a little speech sort of summarising my 30 years there, just a sort of historical run through the uh, territory. And I was chatting to someone afterwards, a friend of mine over breakfast, and he said, I read your speech, he said. Um, that was a love letter to the Bank of England, wasn't it? And he was spot on. And reading your book, I thought, this is Jason's love letter to England. You know, the bits that are going well, the bits that are going less well. Would that be a fair summary of what this book's about, Jason? I thought you were going to say it's a love letter to the Bank of England. <laughs> it's certainly not that, although I did very much enjoy our conversation when I came in to see you. Is it a love letter to England? What it, what it is, I think, is um, it's an exploration of what um, George Orwell called the, the social atmosphere of the country. And, you know, I'm particularly in, interested in England rather than, say, the United Kingdom, because for a long time I, I believed that it, England and Englishness was, was lost within Britishness. And I think Englishness and England have been profoundly misunderstood, um, caricatured, traduced, often associated with reaction or, or loss or nostalgia. But as the movement for Scottish independence grows and it becomes more confident and more assertive, and you know, perhaps the British state ultimately breaks apart, it inevitably forces upon those of us who live in England a reconsideration of who we are and what England is. And, you know, there are parts of England that I do, um, I do love, but there are also parts that um, anger me and frustrate me and all, all, all the themes I explore in the book. But, um, you know, I'm, I want to reclaim, really, uh, a, a gentle, more benign, kinder, um, England and Englishness, I think. That's what I've attempted to do in the book. Perhaps at times it's it's overly romantic, but you know, that's 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 what when you write from the heart, I think that's what that's what happens. Well that comes across very strongly, I think. And one of the really appealing things of the book is exactly that. And it helps, of course, that the book is told through the lens of stories, sure. stories about real people who've done real things. Um and I wonder where the thought about that came from quite a well in a way talking it the story through in that way yes i was very keen um not to write polemic or political analysis or indeed even offer offer coherent policy solutions um 
I think Matthew Said, I, I read a review he wrote of the book in the Sunday Times. It was, a very, it, was, it was a very good review. But Matthew said what's missing from it are sort of policy solutions on on how to tame the tech giants or um, grapple with the, the challenge posed by the Scottish National Party. But that isn't what I was trying to do in the book. Um, Orwellian in atmosphere and um, ambition, perhaps. But it be the book begins really with, um, first of all, the intense polarization of the last of the last decade. We've been living through huge events. If you, my my editorship of the New Statesman coincided with the beginnings of the financial crisis, so really it's been a period of extraordinary politics. And you know I've guided the New Statesman through the financial crisis, its aftermath, the period of fiscal retrenchment um, imposed by the Osborne government, the so-called Great Recession. The Scottish independence referendum of 2014, which which resulted in a narrow victory for the status quo. But, you know, it was narrow, but led then to the collapse of Labour at the 2015 general election. If you, if you recall, Ed Miliband's Labour went into that um, 2015 general election with 41 of the 59 Scottish Westminster seats and came out of it with one from which I think there's no coming back for Labour in Scotland, certainly as the, as a as the dominant or hegemonic party in Scotland. David Cameron had his surprise majority in 2015, which then led to the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum, this time a vote against the status quo, to the astonishment of many in the cognitive elite, um, after which we had the three years of the Brexit wars, stalled up to a point by Boris Johnson's crew pledge to get Brexit done, and his victory in the 29 to, sorry, 2019 general election. And then we went straight in into the pandemic from which we are now emerging. So it's been a period of turbulence, extraordinary politics, upheaval, division. And I just wanted to try and make sense of it, but to do so through telling stories, Andy, because I think you, you yourself have said that it, kind of the, the stories we tell, tell us who we are. And stories are one way we, we sort of understand society we tell stories about societies and the country and the people we are. And the book has kind of literary ambition as well. So um, I use novelistic techniques really to explore larger political themes. So that's that's the idea behind it. And the story you kick off the book with, which is about um, your aunt Connie in, in Harlow, um, uh, and indeed your own experience growing up there. Yeah. Uh, and how that in some ways is a, uh, a story, an exemplar of a failed experiment, if you like, um, in um, economic and social regeneration. Yes. Uh, one that you know, burnt bright in terms of optimism and aspiration at the, the get-go, post-war, but which steadily has uh, failed to make good on that optimism over the subsequent decade. Could say a bit word a few words about you know that journey and, and what lessons we draw from it for you know how we think about building communities and societies. Yes, I'm I was um I was born in the mid-60s in Hollow Newtown in Essex, which was created um under the Newtowns Act of 1946 by the great reforming Attlee government, which kind of swept to power. In 45, Attlee had been previously Churchill's deputy in the wartime uh, coalition. And the third Labour government swept to power in 1945 with the pledge to build the New Jerusalem. And you know, we, we know what followed the creation of the National Health Service and the welfare state, but also the new towns. Um, eight in particular built in and around London. My parents um, were from East London and they, they got married in the 1950s. And they were looking for somewhere to live in. Hard to imagine now, but London was depopulating. And the east of London had been very badly hit by the the, the bombing raids during during the Blitz. Houses and flats had been destroyed um, or badly damaged. And there was a, a need to rehouse people and create opportunities for them um, beyond beyond the capital. And Harlow was Harlow is mentioned actually in the Doomsday Book. It was a, it's an ancient um, rural settlement, 
and it, there was a network of small villages and a new town was built in and around um, the existing villages from the 50s on. Huge investment um, went into it, creating um, council estates and schools and infrastructure and sporting facilities. And growing up there in the 1970s and then into the 80s, I mean, it, was, it had an extraordinary atmosphere. It was, it was, it was socially cohesive. Um, essentially a working class town, although in the early years it also attracted not only people like my parents who were looking for somewhere to live and work, but idealists, intellectuals, socialists, even communists. Um, many of them worked in the schools as teachers or they gathered together um, in the lo local Labour Party groups or around the, the playhouse. They had a very good theatre there in, in arts groups. And they built a, a good network of uh, um, around around the town and around themselves and my father was very much part of that that scene but growing up there um, everything was provided by the state um, we were known as citizens of the future I mean Lord Reef the first director general of the BBC who was also chair of the new towns committee he said we were we were citizens of the future and the new towns were essays in civilization um, incredible ambition um, for the town and we were almost cogs in this grand social democratic experiment none of this I understood at the time of course I was just I was just growing up it was happened to be where I lived and went to school but someone once said to me it was a bit like living in the old GDR but without the Stasi no everything everything was state-led state dictates it was it was an attempt to create I guess a utopian society um, but of course what happens to utopias is they often that things can often go wrong and the huge investment that was there at the beginning when the Harlow Development Corporation was was flourishing didn't continue um, infrastructure began to decline um, many people those children of the um, aspirational middle classes left and quite we left in 1983 and already the town was declining um, once had a very vibrant town centre that was already beginning to um, seem very run down. So we had a great town park that was running down. Many of the sports facilities and the recreational facilities were running down. And that, and there wasn't a kind of second wave of idealists and progressives who shared the belief in the new town ideal. Um, and very quickly, Harlow became associated with a, with a certain kind of defeated mentality, I think, and was seen more recently as one of the left left behind towns i know i know you're interested in spatial inequalities i mean it's half an hour's journey to the um, to the city of london by train um to the to the great way of the great great financial metropolis the globalized city city of london but you know 30 minutes in the other direction you come you 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 come upon one of um nigel farage's left behind towns and it's it's poignant and it leads to us to a sense of loss, I think, for, for many of those those who are still there or many of those who were for, forced to move away. And I think you can see Harlow as a kind of microcosm of, 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 of a larger problem in England itself with, with the smaller towns and indeed even the smaller cities, the far away, um, um, the, sh the provincial shires, the coastal, coastal districts, where there's a sense of kind of disappointed aspiration and something was promised that wasn't quite fulfilled. But the book begins with me returning to the town um, to investigate what was called a, the, the Brexit murder, if you recall. A Polish migrant um, was attacked in a shopping centre called The Stowe um, in August 2016, just after the Brexit referendum. And it was very quick, and he, he was killed uh, as a consequence, but it was very quickly misreported as a as a murder and as a xenophobic attack. And the world's media got very interested in it. The New York Times said that this unfortunate Polish migrant had been kicked to death by a group of wild youths. Um, Jean-Claude Juncker, the European Commission, referenced it in his president's address and said this, look, look what's happening. Polish migrants are being murdered on the streets of Essex. What has happened to England? So this piqued my interest and I go back to investigate what happened. And it was much more complicated than what had been reported. And actually it turned out to be an act of manslaughter at, by, by um, the act carried out by very young, young youth. 
And um, by going back, I began to think about my the origins of the new town itself, my parents coming to the new town, what the new town meant, um, not only then, but today. So, so Har I think Harlow really is the is the frame from which everything else um, is organized. And there are there are many hundreds, perhaps thousands of Harlows yes. right across England. That's the that's the truth of it. Um, and you mentioned Brexit. I mean, the plight of Harlow, um, I'm sure you'd agree, say so in the book, was a significant contributor towards the vote for leave. Yes. Uh, and lots of places. I suppose in a way, one question I had for you, I puzzled this myself long and hard. Do you remember when um, the Queen came to the LSE after the global financial crisis and said, how do you not see it coming? Yes. I suppose my question on Brexit is, how do we not see it coming? Because Harlow had been like that for years, if not decades. And yeah. those left behind places, they've been like that for years, if not decades. How do we not see it coming? Yes, I mean, it's, it's a good, I think 68% of the population of Harlow voted for Brexit. Every district of Essex voted for Brexit. And so it goes on. Um, you know, no, we, some of us did see it coming. I mean, I'm not saying explicitly that I, um, I I predicted that there would be a referendum and it would go against the the, the status quo in, in 2016. But for a long time, I've been monitoring events, for example, in Scotland. I mean, different different forces in play. But when the SNP won the, the 2011 um, Scottish Parliament um, elections with a, with, a, with a big majority, a surprise majority, in a system which in many ways had been rigged to create um, coalition governments and prevent a majority. I mean, I remember in London, the Labour Party were astounded by, by that result. And they were even more astounded by what happened um, since 2014 in Scotland. So I think there was, a, there was deep complacency about what was happening um, beyond, beyond the great cities of England. And you know, the effects of market-driven liberal globalization, I mean, there've been many beneficiaries, not least hundreds of millions of people in China have been lifted out of poverty. And it certainly benefited um, you know, um, the elites in, in, many, in many countries. Um, but there were many losers as well. And I think this is one of the things Tony Blair never quite understood. Although the warning signs were there, in one of the chapters, Andy, I mentioned the famous encounter between um, Mrs. Duffy and Gordon Brown in 2010, um, during the 20, 2010 general election when, when they met on the streets of Rochdale. Mrs. Duffy, if you recall, just gone out to buy some milk and, and some sugar or, or, or some tea, I think some, some tea. And she bumps into Sue Nye, um, Gordon Brown's aide and so-called gatekeeper. And, and Sue Nye says to Mrs. Duffy, are you Labour? Mrs. Duffy says, yeah, of course I'm Labour. And soon I says, well, the Prime Minister's here. Would you like to meet him? And Mrs. Duffy says, yes, of course I'd like to meet him. And the gatekeeper metaphorically opens the gate and Mrs. Duffy walks straight in and we, we know what happened next. And that was a warning, wasn't it? I mean, in the, in, in, in the book, the chapter in which Mrs. Duffy appears, indeed, it's the same chapter in which you appear talking about spatial inequalities. Um, it's called A Visitor from the Future. Because in many ways, for Blair, with his ambitions of a liberal, open, modern, dynamic, progressive country, someone like Mrs. Duffy and what she represented and what she wanted must have seen like an inconvenience or maybe a relic from the past from which Blair was in flight. But actually, she appeared that day before Gordon Brown to warn him of what was coming and what might befall Labour in the years ahead. And indeed, so when you say, why didn't we see it coming? Perhaps we weren't looking hard enough because out there in the small towns and, and the faraway um, shires or whatever you call them, there were many Mrs. Duffy's lurking. And they felt that they were losing under the, un, under the new liberal market globalization. They were unsettled by the decline of their local environment. Um, often their hospitals might be in special measures. Their high streets would be, would be boarded up. And they were worried about social cohesion. And also they were worried about uncontrolled migration. But of course, when Mrs. Duffy raised the issue of un uncontrolled migration, and she was specifically talking about migrants from Eastern Europe, she was dismissed as a bigot by Gordon. 
And I think that 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 encounter was a parable, really, of, of, of something bigger, which is why I think it's it, it's resonated and we remember it even today. And you're right. I mean, the, there were lots of Gillian Duffy's the length and breadth of the country, um, uh, but the voices, for whatever reason, didn't make it onto national news as on, that, on, on that occasion. When you're talking that there about the loss, um, Jason, felt by many, um, I mean, the, the loss ca came in many and various forms. There was the loss of uh, jobs in some cases, uh, of incomes, of communities. Your Aunt Connie, it was, uh, it was GP surgery, I think, in her, in, in her case. But I wonder whether of all those really important um, like real world factors, for many, the most important loss of all was of a sense of agency, of control over your life, of this the tsunami of things um, coming to your community and you're feeling really unable somehow to, to get control over them or get control over your life or your community. I mean, that loss of agency strikes me as, you know, in some ways the kind of key. It's why take back control was such a compelling tagline. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree completely. And that 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 indeed was why take take back control um, resonated. I remember speaking to Michael Sandel. I interviewed him a couple of weeks before the the vote um, took place in twenty sixteen, um, the Brexit vote. And and Sandel spoke very much to me about agency. Indeed, if anyone wants to read the interview, it's there on the New Statesman website. And in effect, Sandel. Um, not exactly predicting Brexit, but he said he understood it if it happened. He, he, he understood why so many um, would vote against what David Cameron was asking them to vote for. And he saw it as an expression of uh, mass disaffection, but also um, a loss of agency. And he also s said something similar about the rise of Trump and Trumpism. And indeed, Trump won the presidential election later that, that same year. But agency is crucial. When I mean, you mentioned my Aunt Connie and the story I tell about her, she was the first of our family to come to the new town. She settled in an area called Potter Street, a former village, and her local GP um, surgery uh, was called Osler House. It's somewhere called Prentice Place. The very name is resonant place, a sense of place. And I, I was born directly opposite, so I know exactly where it where it was. Sadly, it no longer is. And in February um, 2018. She received a letter, as did many of those who used the doctor's surgery, the patients of the doctor's surgery, to say it would be closed two months later in April. Um, it was a fait accompli. There was no local cons consultation, no consultation with the local council, not even consultation with the very good local MP, Robert Halfon, um, a conservative who's, who in many ways embodies that kind of white ban conservatism um, that's popular in parts of Essex. And I wrote about Connie at the time and then she, she started a little campaign locally to save the GP practice, um, opened in um, 1955, as I say. And by this point, Connie, Connie was 90. She's still alive, fortunately. She's now 94. And she would have had to take four separate buses to, to get to the nearest GP surgery. So it, she was outraged. And she started a campaign, which got some national traction. She was interviewed by the BBC. And the Daily Mail got interested in her, her campaign and they interviewed her and profiled her. And they investigated what was going on. And it turned out that the ultimate owners of that national NHS GP practice was a private insurance company in the United States, in Missouri. And they said it wasn't financially viable, so they closed it. And if that, I mean, that for me, again, is a, is a parable of, of loss and, and of a loss of agency. And talking to Connie, my aunt, and some of her friends who were campaigning to save this GP um, practice, they spoke about feelings of humiliation and powerlessness, um, being powerless. They had no control over their, their local environment, but nor did, nor did the local council and nor did the local MP. So what does that tell us about the situation in, 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 in the country, about what, as I say, at the I said at the beginning, Orwell's sense of the social atmosphere of the country? It told us something, I think, profound and fundamental. So I, I, I begin with Connie's story, really, um, as a way into a, a, a wider exploration. And each chapter begins with, uh, with a story. 
as a great story, a compelling story. Other of the stories in in the book, Jason, deal with this: um, how do you strike this appropriate balance between um, respecting tradition and heritage on the one hand, while welcoming diversity and modernity on the other? How you get that balance right? And indeed, you have lots of examples in your book of of not getting that balance right. What interestingly. One of the people you point towards as having struck that balance in a in a good place is Gareth Southgate, England football manager. And you talk about a, um, I think the words to use are progressive patriotism uh, that he exhibited or has exhibited um, throughout his time as uh, England football manager. Can you say a word too about you know about that and about how you think we, we most appropriate strike that subtle balance. Yes, I'm. I'm. I mean, what I'm ultimately interested in, Andy, is is a is a politics of the common good, and you know, Orwell Orwell had the phrase common decency, but also about reaching out across difference and bridge building. And what has interested me about the England fo- national football team, particularly during the period that Southgate has been the manager, is the way Southgate has been able to bring together a very diverse group of young players, um, a multiracial team, and created great harmony among that group um, around, around the St. George's flag. But also he's placed himself within a tradition. He's, he wrote an essay just before the Euros called Dear England. That was a love letter to England, more so than my book. And he spoke about his father serving um, in the military in the Second World War, his own patriotism, um, his love of country, his respect for the monarchy, the pride he felt when he first played for England as a, as a player. But at the same time, he then said, a respect for tradition does not need to be in opposition to a modern, open, dynamic society. And he embraces change. And he's very proud of... Um, the political position struck by some of his activist players like Raheem Sterling around race issue, racist issues and um, Marcus Rashford around poverty issues and there are others too, campaigners in the squad such as Tyrone Mings or, or Henderson at Liverpool. And he, he actively supports his players' um, desire to take the knee before games. And he says there's no need to be have fake oppositions between tradition on the one hand and patriotism but also adopting a more progressive, liberal, um, open worldview. And I think too often we allow false oppositions to define who we are and and binaries, and we don't need to. And throughout the book, I speak to bridge builders like Southgate. I speak to the imam um, at the East London Mosque in Whitechapel, um, who had previously been at the Finsbury Park Mosque and intervened after a, a terror attack. Um, in June 2017, when a far-right extremist drove a van into a group of um, Muslims, late, Muslim worshippers late at night during Ramadan, and the van driver was pulled out of the van and was about to be attacked, and the imam emerged from the mosque and said, please stop, no one must touch this man, you know, we must call the police, and the crowd stopped. You know, he's a young imam only in his late 30s, and of course, the area of Finsley Park, uh, particularly the famous Finsley Park Mosque, is notorious because of Abu Hamza and um, his period of, of intense radicalization at the mosque. But here was a different narrative that was being um, told that summer by, by the Imam. And later on, I, I went to see him when he he's now at the um, East London Mosque. And we had a long, thoughtful conversation about identity and Islam and what it means to be English today, not just British, but English. And can we create for England a more cohesive identity of a kind that we've been able to evolve for Britishness since the Second World War? And I think this country, I would say better than any other European country, has absorbed waves of migrants from different backgrounds and ethnicities and religions and cultures, um, certainly more harmoniously than France increasingly more harmoniously than the Scandinavian countries, without the emergence of a significant neo-fascist or fascist party. 
And I think that that's an achievement. And what I like about Britishness is it's not about deep ancient roots. It's civic, it's inclusive, it's non-racial, it's plural, and it's about compound and hyphenated identities. And I would, I would, one of the reasons I'm so interested in Englishness is because I worry about the loss of Britishness. And if indeed Scotland succeeds in breaking from the United Kingdom and breaking the British state. And I think that, you know, that's a live, live and ever present um, prospect. And there are many friends of mine who, black Londoners or, or South Asian heritage, who just define themselves first and foremost as British. And I write a little bit, bit in the book about the rap superstar Stormzy, who says defiantly, I'm black British in my diction, approach, dress. I am black British and I know that I know this identity because many of my friends share it. Um, but what Southgate has done, I think, and some of his players in recent times has created something similar, a black English identity, which I like and welcome. And we saw the flourishing around Southgate's England team last summer. I mean, he's had a more bumpy time recently, end of last season, but that's a results based dip, nothing to do with culture and politics. But there was something special in the country um, last summer during, during the Euros um, when so many people were inspired by what Southgate and his players achieved. I know, I know it ended badly at Wembley and there was a, there was a lot of unrest that night and then un terribly the racial abuse of the, of, of the three players who missed their penalties in the shootout against Italy. But there was also so much that was good, I think. And... You know, that's that's the hopefulness in my book, as well as the exploration of loss and the slight melancholy undercurrent that runs through some of the stories. And it's because of the, my encounters with, with these bridge builders. So to I was going to ask you about uh, that at the end, um, because the, there is a, a theme undercurrent, maybe more than undercurrent through your book um, of, of loss, of a sort of fatalism about the future, that um, we've been losing ground as a country over time, at least in relative, at least in relative terms. Um, I was going to ask you what, what it would take. One's in a sense in which that can become self-sustaining if you're not if you're not careful. Um, that pessimism can become uh, self-fulfilling. I wondered what you thought it would take to kind of break that psyche, to break that mentality, to, to arrest that fatalism about our future. I guess we've seen examples since the Second World War for small patches of that having happened, maybe the immediate post-war settlement, maybe a bit of Thatcherism, certainly a degree of Blairism, um, but never in a way that's, that's permanently shifted the cycle. And, and that, that sense of melancholia that you mentioned. Yes. Is, is there anything that would change that, you think, on a durable <laughs> basis? I think that's a big, that's a big question. I think when you, when you think deeply about Englishness, I think that's a sense of something lost has run through the English centuries. So it's not a, it's not a recent manifestation tied to the loss of empire or the post-colonial period. I mean, it's there in Shakespeare, it's there in Chaucer, it, it's there, it's there bef even before the Norman Conquest. Um, after the conquest, there was, of course, the in history, what, what's called the Norman yoke, a sense that um, a French speaking elite imposed a new, a new settlement on, on the English. But it's that sense of something purer and deeper and a more innocent England runs runs through the culture and then after the act of union of what 1707 englishness then becomes lost in britishness it becomes a top-down imperial um construct and i think britishness probably peaked during the two wars and we had that great sense of national unity and sense of national cohesion which followed the 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 followed after the immediate um um, post-war settlement but you're right there was periods of early Thatcherism you now Thatcherism what was it, it was essentially a counter-hegemonic project um, to try and 
left as, as the Thatcherites saw it, England out of its out of its torpor and used the market as the mechanism to drive um, innovation and change. Blair wanted to consolidate while also softening um, the harder edges of Thatcherism, but he was very much a liberal optimist. And uh, in 95, he gave a speech where he said, we, I want this to be a young country. And then he said, we will be a young country as if such a thing could be willed into being because he, he wanted to escape from what he called the forces of conservatism and be free from the taint of the past to create this new dynamic, progressive, open, modern British, British society that rode the waves of the new liberal globalization. Now, where are we today? We're caught, aren't we, between trying to, trying to forge this new post-Brexit identity. But even, even the identity of what a post-Brexit Britain is, is contradictory and confused because there's the, there's the more libertarian, um, buccaneering, free market Brexit favoured by Rhys Mogg and Daniel Hannan and Andrew Neil and The Spectator. And there's the Brexit associated with the people we've been speaking about earlier, those who had lost agency and were suffering from a sense of loss or disaffection. And how do you bring those two sides together? I think, I think it's an incredibly difficult question. And then we've also got, we're, we're haunted by what the social theorist Mark Fisher called lost futures. So I think there's a generation of young people who were educated to expect a certain settlement or a certain future that never happened. So not only are they, are they haunted by what's been lost, they're haunted by a future that never happened. And I think that's quite a complex situation. I think Corbyn, when he erupted after winning the Labour leadership, was able to inspire a generation, particularly a debt-burdened student generation, because although Corbyn himself had been around a long time and many of us of a certain age knew who he was, what his politics were, what his associations were, he unequivocally rejected um, austerity and spoke a, a language that many, I think, of his young supporters hadn't heard a mainstream politician speak before. So for those Corbynites supporters, there was a sense of hope and renewal for a period, I think. And that flowed into that, that extraordinary general election of 2017. I think where we are today is in a very confused state. Um, with the aspirations to level up, which I know you're very interested in, and devolve power and political agency away from the cities. But how that is achieved at a time of rising inflation and a war raging in Russia, which is which is leading to kind of resource scarcities, it's it's very challenging. And I know, I know as I understand it, there's great pressure from the Treasury pushing back against some of the more ambitious um, elements of the levelling up um, experiment. But that was Boris Johnson's big idea, wasn't it, in, in, 20, in the 2019 general election, not only to get Brexit done, whatever that means, and Brexit is, of course, a process, not an event, but the other big idea was the attempt to level up. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's clearly what must have attracted you to to, to begin working with some of, you know, with Gove and Danny Kruger and Neil O'Brien and others. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, as a, you know, as a, on the face of it, a way of tackling uh, many of the economic inefficiencies and social injustices that we've been discussing today, and which we all know um, exist. And, and um, I think if we are to reverse that, that tide of loss, or that sense of fatalism. We need more places that have a story, to go back to story, about themselves that's looking um, upwards into the future rather than backwards into the floor. And you can spot places that are doing well and places that are doing badly by that. Are they looking backwards and down or forwards and up? Um, and on that, I'm conscious our conversation so far has been quite quite English in every sense, yeah. Jason. And uh, the last thing I want people to come away with is the impression that you and I are little Englanders. So, 
it strikes me quite a lot of what we discussed today has real resonance though right across the planet certainly in many western economies they're wrestling with similar sorts of issues maybe a bit less acute in some cases but that sense of loss that sense of um fatalism that the kind of poverty of not pecuniary poverty in the traditional sense but kind of poverty of opportunity um that i think is so gnawing on a national psyche i think you see that across large swathes of america i think you see that a lot, lot across large swathes of the continent of europe and one of the extent to which you know although this is a book about england in a way the the tides that you describe are apparent right around the world really yeah certainly in um you know parts of europe that i know well um um the united states even australia um i think what interests me is is what holds together large and diverse secular democracies now how do how do communities and even nations cohere and what gives i think the uk its peculiarity is it's a multinational state and it's a very fragile multinational state okay so there's spain you can you can see spain as a kingdom uh, similarly fragile and vulnerable with secessionist movements particularly in Catalonia, formerly in the Basque country, and, and regionalized and, and deeply divided. Um, at, but, you know, the very question of what holds together a large and diverse secular society, you see it in France all the time. Um, certainly in Scandinavia, we once saw the Scandinavian countries as being um, social, kind of beacons of social democratic progress, no longer so. And remarkably cohesive societies, no longer so. One only needs to spend any time in Sweden to find out the problems in that country. But yeah, they, they repeat um, questions of identity, the nation, um, cohesion, um, inequality, intergenerational inequality, divisions between the metropolis and the smaller, the smaller towns, regional inequalities these are these are big issues which which aren't particular to england or indeed britain and they're they're big issues right across europe and you know trump was able i think in many ways to exploit them very successfully particularly when he was being advised by steve bannon who had a theory of history and wanted to push back against what he saw as identity politics and approach and and embrace a form of kind of economic nationalism um, I almost said autarky, but you, it wasn't autarky, but it was certainly a form of, of populist economic nationalism. But, you know, these, these are questions that are directly relevant, I think, to, to the UK. No, the book isn't, the book isn't about, um, it's, not a, it's not a book for little Englanders, but it's for, it's for anyone who's interested in, you know, big ideas of, of identity, the nation, um, place, and how we how we how we find that that greater politics of a common good? How do we bring people together rather than seek seek division? And how do we make we remake or reweave the social fabric? Um, and I'm 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 you know this this matters to me. Um, this matters to me politically, but personally, you know, socially, but also ethically. These these are also moral questions, I think. They are, and what's interesting on just these issues is they they matter to everyone. Um, that's why they're they're so important. That what you've described today, you know, shapes the life of pretty much every citizen, not just in England, the UK, but 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 well beyond for all the reasons you've said. We're coming to the end, uh, Jason. I want to ask you one last question. And I know you said the books about asking the questions rather than providing the the answers, but I'm going to grant you a single wish, uh, one change that you can affect in England, in the UK, wherever you like, really, that would begin to not not fully resolve, but would begin to address some of the challenges you've set down so, um, so elegantly and compellingly, not just in the book, but today on this podcast. So. What would be your your single wish for for England right now to 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 reshape the map? 
I would like, I think, and it's beyond England because it affects the whole UK. I would like to see a complete reconfiguration of the of, of the United Kingdom, and um, yeah, you know, the abolition of the House of Lords, a new voting system, um, House of Lords replaced by maybe a Senate of the regions and the nations, um, certainly a form of proportion, proportional representation. Um, rapid devolution of power from from Whitehall to um, the regions and the towns um, you know more more power for the likes of um, Andy Burnham and is it Andy Street and others um, Steve Rotherham you know the mayors and I would like to see the British state hold but I think the status quo is unacceptable you can't simply um, when there's when there's a majority for the SNP, a powerful majority, you can't simply just delay. You have to you have to either address the Scottish question definitively through another referendum, or through a complete reconfiguration of um, the British state. But that complete reconfiguration of the British state, I would would suggest, depends upon a change of government. And at present, neither Labour nor the um, Liberal Democrats are strong enough to win on their own. So it may be that we we need we we need tactical voting, and uh, a form of um, cross party partnership, but um, huge change is necessary. I think. Well, there's a massive idea for us all to take away and cogitate on, and a really uh, compellingly put one, I have to say. Um, I was going to mention that actually the two Andes you mentioned, Burnham and Street, uh, are coming in. Uh, to the RSA tomorrow for an event. I mean, that doesn't work, of course. This podcast goes out on Thursday, and I'm speaking <laughs> on Monday, so you've already missed it, I'm afraid. But you'll be able to watch it on 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 the playback uh, on YouTube. I'm sure but we're out of time. Um, um, and to those of you watching, I hope that conversation today has given you uh, a deep insight. Certainly, even me a deep insight, not just into Jason's book um, here. Who are we now? Uh, I'm not on commission, by the way. Um, uh, but also into the, the tectonic forces shaping England, shaping the UK, shaping many of our societies uh, across the world. You can get a hold of a copy uh, by looking uh, here in the chat box or on the RSA website for those who want to uh, buy one. You can also get the very latest updates on more fantastic events like these by hitting the subscribe button on YouTube apparently, and all that's left for me to do then is to say a massive thank you uh, to our guest, uh, Jason Cowley, for what I found an absolutely fascinating uh, conversation, a conversation uh, that deserves to be continued, the conversation that really will uh, shape the lives of millions of people across the UK and beyond. Jason, on the behalf of everyone at the RSA, huge thanks for today. Thank you all for watching and see you all next time.